Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part 22 of Ultron, the real robot. Check out the last episode to see me making the arms and things move. I started to wire in permanent electronics and a sort of hint of a control scheme and we need to talk about that some more today. The plan is today to make the head move and sort out this forearm mixing mechanism. Check out the previous episodes to see how that works. Before we get stuck in, I'd like to tell you about a British science fiction film that's being made called Offworld. And you may remember a while ago it had a website redesign and I had some new graphics and a new logo. And those were done by an artist called Terry Cooper and he's writing and directing Offworld. So check out their Kickstarter page, they've in fact already got well funded by the time this video goes out, but there is a few more days to fund it if you'd like to get a t-shirt or some of the other rewards. The film is going to be made, it's being made in Wales where Doctor Who is made. It's basically a really good thing for the community where lots of people are getting involved making props, acting and so on. Basically most people are volunteering but they need some costs for the props, food, stuff like that. So check out that Kickstarter and if you can spare a pound or a dollar, That'd be really great if you can fund it. All right, let's get on with Ultron. In order to make the neck work, I need to power these servos as well as some 12 volt motors in the neck and in the rest of the robot. So I mentioned I had a bit of a power supply issue there. Most of this has been running on a 12 volt power supply, but I was gonna get some little step down converters to run everything at five and six volts, um, including the servos in the arms there, which I was gonna use battery emulator circuits from RC. But instead I've just gone and bought a power supply that has five and 12 volts on it. The best way to get a big cheap power supply, which does 5 and 12 volts, is to use a PC power supply. This one was about £20, and we can see here that we've got 5 volts at 36 amps and 12 volts at 30 amps, so that should be no problem. So let's see what we get out of it. If I power it on, we'll find absolutely nothing happens in fact, and that's because it's waiting for the soft on-off switch to be pressed. And there's a connector on this connector that goes to the motherboard, which actually turns it on once the mains power is on, and you'll find... Um, there's a green and black wire, and if you look on Google Images, there's quite a lot of diagrams and instructables on this. So we just need to bridge those pins out. And I'll put a more permanent uh, thing on there eventually, but that should now be powered on. Whoops, if I keep that wire in. And we should find the fan is powered on, and if I now stick my meter into the red and black wires, we get five volts, and red and yellow gives me 12 volts, so that's pretty good. And that should be perfectly happy. There's also an orange wire on some of the other connectors, which I think is 3.3 volts. I've just broken out the 12 volt wires for now, and I'm using these chocolate blocks, which are pluggable. So one half has pins, the other half has sockets, and you can plug these on. So I've just powered up the left-hand side here. The other two are for the right-hand side. I've got two more connectors here for it. And I've still got all my five volts and some extra 12 volts spare. So if we power that on, we should see it all works again. So now if I twiddle the knobs that I've got just over here, we should see that the arm moves. So we just check all of that works. Looks pretty good. Yeah, all of that works. And I'd assume since power is good, the other side works as well. I just wanted to address some comments that I made on the last video about the apparent wobbliness or floppiness of this robot. So obviously when it moves around, you can see this whole thing wobbles. And the reason for that was by design. So the spine is in fact made of Ninja Flex. You can check out the earlier episodes for that. I have two more actuators in the abs, which are gonna bend that all around. And also have flexible parts in every joint, which will have series elastic actuators basically built into them with four sensitive resistors. So when you push a joint, it will actually be able to sense you moving it. So this is gonna be quite an interactive robot that people can come up and push and it'll be able to sense when it's moving and may put an inertial measurement unit in its body so not only can it stabilize itself but it can also sense when you're pushing it as well as when the joints are being driven back but that's all going to come in the sensor section so although it looks like it's wobbling around now obviously I need better motion control over those joints so they're less jerky anyway but in fact that's going to be a feature of the finished overview of how this thing appears when it's done and it's being controlled by its own AI and check out part one for more on that. To control the head, I'm using an L298, which is a two amp, two channel motor controller, which is four amps in total. So you can parallel up the channels and get four amps out of it. And that's more than enough for just that head turning motor. The head itself is gonna be controlled with another Arduino Pro Mini. And once it's wired in for testing, that will just be stuck on the end of the Bluetooth interface till I've decided what to do. So I can test the head independently from both sides of the body. 
Just going to attempt to explain what I've done here to parallel up these channels. This is my signal wire coming in, which will be PWM from the Arduino. And that wires into pins 1 and 2, and green goes to 1 and 3, and the blue one goes to 2 and 4 as well. So normally what you do is have two channels operating two motors, 1 and 2 in, 1 and 2 out, 3 and 4 in, 3 and 4 out. But I've paralleled those up, so we've also paralleled up the output. So outputs 1 and 2 are connected to 3 and 4, making sure I've connected the same ones together. So 1 and 3 are connected together, which is the black wire, and I've soldered that on the bottom of the board here so I can use the screw terminal still to attach the motor. And I've also connected together 2 and 4, the same as I did with the input. And that means they're all paralleled up and they'll both work together, giving me double the current capability. Right, there's my L298. The wires are just poking out at the moment. It's eventually going to go in the top of here where there's a space. The motor's just behind there. So I've got the motor wired into that screw terminal for the output. I've also got 12 volts coming in, which is going to power this motor. It's a 12 volt motor. And the L298 has got its own 5 volt regulator, so I don't need to wire 5 volts to it. You can see the little power light is on there. All right, so I fitted the Arduino Pro Mini, and I've just put it on the side here for now with a bit of sticky tape. It's probably going to go around the back so you can't see it with a nice little case, but for now it isn't. I've got my Arduino uh, Bluetooth, in fact, adapter on the top there, which is just plugged straight into it, the same as when I tested the sides. So we're now reading the serial data from my little test transmitter for the three axis. I've only got one working for now but that's just being put straight into the Arduino and it's running PID against the potentiometer you can just see on top and turning the motor. So if you wanna see more about me putting this together and testing it the first time, have a look at part 15. That's also got the code in, but for now, if I turn my knob, my head now turns in that axis. So now I need to run in the five volts and sort out the servos as well. I've run in five volts from that power supply. I've still got the electronics running on a different five volt. That's still running on the USB power bank. But now I've coded in the servos to work with that Arduino Mini as well. So if I turn my knobs down here, we've got one that rotates the head. And we've got one for back to front motion and one for side to side motion. So obviously they all work at once. I probably need to make those sticks a bit shorter because obviously I get the most side-to-side -side movement when the head's up, otherwise there's not enough travel in the servos. But uh, nonetheless, it seems to work okay. It can move all around. Uh, those sticks are a bit bendy. I've used NinjaFlex and ABS to make them, but they don't actually support the weight of the head, so I need to make them shorter and probably fatter. But apart from that, the electronics is working. It's now time to sort out the forearm. So if you remember, we've got this switching mechanism with a motor that moves on a servo which is here, and it switches between three gears that have got worm gears attached. We've got one that pulls the elbow up, one that makes this thing rotate, and one that will eventually pull the hand up. So we need to sort out some sort of prioritization method to decide which one it should hit first and how it should resolve the positions. If you remember, I've got one potentiometer fitted on the elbow joint here on this crank, because there's no way of putting it in line without making the elbow really wide. So that turns on this pivot here when the elbow moves, so that works okay. I've now also fitted a potentiometer on the bottom here with another crank that means when this thing rotates, which is the center position for the servo, then it can measure that angle as well, because obviously I can't get that in line really at the back or the front because there's no space, and that's where the hand is going to go. So if I rotate this thing, Takes a while to do it manually at the moment, but we can see now we've got a different angle on our potentiometer there. So we need an algorithm that will resolve that position as well, and we can switch between the two and prioritize them. I think what we need to do is prioritize the one with the biggest error. So essentially we've got a place that it needs to be, a place where it is, and we can measure the distance there, or the difference in numbers at least, we can prioritize the one that's got the biggest difference. So of course we've got the elbow, we've got the rotation, and we've got the hand, so we've actually got three to prioritize, and we can work through them in order. But of course what will happen is, if we find that the elbow perhaps has the biggest difference, once we've moved it a bit, and then we go and check again, we might find that then the rotation has the next biggest difference, and once we move that a tiny amount, then again, the elbow still has the smallest difference or the biggest difference. So move that a tiny amount, and then we'll end up oscillating between them. So we need some sort of method to make sure that the one with the biggest difference gets resolved completely first, and then probably a bit of a wait to check that I don't move it again. So if I constantly sit here with my motion capture suit doing this, 
I want this join to keep moving because that's the one that's got the most motion. So somehow we need to basically carry on prioritizing that even if I move my elbow till I stop moving it, then I want the elbow to move. So I have to have a think about how that's going to work. I've now got five knobs on my little tester here. So we've got the three for the upper arm. We did have one for the forearm bending or the elbow, and now we've got one for the forearm twisting as well. I would have six, including the hand, but I haven't actually built the hand yet. So we don't need to worry about that. And this is just the test rig that I'm sending data to the robot over Bluetooth to test what happens when it gets data. Eventually this gets replaced with its own AI that sits in between the motion capture suit and the robot. And here's the code I've come up with. So this is very similar to my R6 multitasking code for my R6 droid, which uses flags and timers to see where it is in the, in the code and decide what to do. So basically it's a state machine where flags get set into a different state, which sets conditions as we go through the code. So uh, basically we've got some variables declared at the top. We've got positions for the servo there. We're using the servo library. We've also got these read variables that read in from serial. And we've got some for the actual elbow. So the uh, basically desired position with some default values if there's no data so it doesn't shoot to the end. We've also got the actual positions. And we've also got the magnitude here, which is the ones that uses to work out which is bigger, whether there's bigger difference in the elbow or bigger difference in the forearm to prioritize which one to move. I'm using millis and previous millis, so we're basically bookmarking the time and seeing how much has elapsed. So I've got some variables here for the time, and we've also got some flags here that are being set. So um, at the beginning here, we're setting the PWM for the motor, attaching the servo, and we're also going to be reading serial, so that's the serial setup. Essentially, this reads in all the serial data. Um, it reads them into variables, and if the last character is what's expected, which is an A, then it puts them into the ones in the program loop, and that to some extent checks the data is okay. I'm then reading in the pots for the two positions, which are the potentiometers on the arm rotation and elbow, so we can get those actual positions, and then subtracting the actual position from the demand position to work out which is bigger, whether it's the elbow or the forearm that could be prioritized, and we've got these magnitude variables to tell us which is bigger. We've then got two massive if statements, and those if statements say if the elbow is bigger than the forearm, then set a flag um, to one here, and it only does this if a flag is zero, which is right at the beginning, and we'll see what happens as the program goes through. So it sets the elbow to one, the forearm to nine, which um, is not a state that's valid, so it gets ignored. If it's the other way around, the forearm is bigger than the elbow, then it sets the forearm flag to one and the elbow flag to nine, so the elbow gets ignored. We're also bookmarking the time again and setting the relevant servo positions to put those gears in the right place. I did have some serial statements here for diagnostics, which I've commented out, so I could see it was making the right decision. There's then two blocks of code, one here for dealing with the elbow, and a very similar one for dealing with the forearm. And basically, when the flag is one, it's made the decision, and enough time has elapsed for the servo to move, it then sets the flag to two and moves to the next stage. If the flag is two, we've then got three possible outcomes, which check if the elbow is bigger than the actual elbow position, so the demand is bigger than where it really is, plus a threshold, it turns the motor one way, if it's the other way around, minus the threshold, it turns it the other way. And if it's in the middle, then it stops the motor. And that's this piece of code here. It says if the elbow is smaller than the actual elbow plus 30, and it's bigger than the actual elbow minus 30, so it's within that threshold, it stops the motor. It also sets this solved flag to one. And this is the part about concentrating on that joint if it's still moving. So it may be that if I'm moving it quickly, it passes through the dead spot, but I don't want it to just go back straight away and decide which one is bigger. So if I were moving the forearm rotation quickly, but the elbow is moving slowly, I don't want it to oscillate between the two trying to solve them. So basically, unless it's been solved for more than 500 milliseconds, it never sets those flags back to zero. Um, and if it is solved for more than 500 milliseconds, it does, and it goes back to the being, and it looks at which one is bigger. So basically it prioritizes first the magnitude of the error, then it prioritizes the one with the motion, and it concentrates on that till it's settled for more than 500 milliseconds. Obviously the forearm code is the same in reverse, and at the end of both of them, all the flags get resolved and set back to zero. So it goes back to the if statement to decide which one is bigger. So let's give that a go. So I've got my two uh, knobs here, which operate the uh, forearm and the elbow. So the right hand one is the elbow up and down. The left hand one is rotating the forearm. So if I just turn this one a little bit, we should find that the elbow goes up and down. 
that seems to work okay. There's a bit of a mechanical issue with this linkage. I think I need to change the, the uh, leverage angle. But um, anyway, the logic works. So if I uh, rotate the forearm now with the other pot, we can see that that's moving and that all works fine. So now if I keep wiggling the forearm here, so it rotates backwards and forwards, and I slowly turn the pot for the elbow while I'm doing it, you'll find it's still concentrating on the forearm here. And um, if I let go half a second, it then goes back to the beginning and goes and solves the elbow. And that's the same if I now go and alter the, for the uh, elbow, I should say, and keep wiggling that a bit, and I slowly modify the forearm, it still concentrates on the elbow till I let go for more than half a second, then it goes and does the forearm. So the logic seems to work pretty well. Obviously, I actually need to prioritize three motors because I've got the hand gripping as well, which is the third place on that gearbox. So I've got that third axis to prioritize. But that's just going to be another if statement to the top of that code and another similar code to the forearm and the elbow that makes sure it's fixed before it goes back and looks at the others. And of course, you could use this mechanism for a whole bunch of motors, maybe up to 10 and having that motor rotating all the way around. So you can multiplex one motor with one servo or one other motion that moves it so that you can get lots of outputs and prioritize them all. Um, in fact, it'd probably be more practical just to have the one motor for the bicep and two servos for the wrist and the hand motions. But I just wanted to do this for fun, really. So next time we need to look at probably acceleration curves. As I mentioned, it's quite jerky at the moment and we probably need to have some acceleration and deceleration on all those joints. Perhaps I can send more serial data to the Arduinos to tell it how much acceleration and deceleration to have. And that's gonna get coded into its AI basically so that it has a kind of attitude about how sharply it moves. Um, also, I've got all of the sensors to go in and the series elastic actuator. So we've still got quite a bit to do on the motion control. Now, last time I mentioned that each Arduino could be on a common serial bus, or there could be another Arduino that talks to all of them on its own separate serial interfaces. There are quite a lot of useful comments about perhaps jumpering the Arduinos so that each one will get its ID from a hardware jumper and I can put the code on all of them. But in fact, the two arms are pretty much the same anyway, and there's only two of them. So the ID is really only a code variable at the top of the code. So I could just change that when I code them up. So that's not too big. The head is hard coded to be different anyway because there's only three axis. But essentially at the moment I can send data to all of that whole robot and we should be able to get all of those axes to move and that's five in each arm and three in the head. But that's actually all I'm going to do for now. We'll hopefully have it all moving next time and some better motion control. So don't forget to check out the off-world Kickstarter and look at the beginning if you skip past that to see what that's all about. And also subscribe to my channel for more updates on this and various other projects. You can also check out my Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash xrobots where you can get access to some exclusive rewards including a live broadcast with me and also all of my main build videos early. All right, that's all for now.